We're here today with Commander Mary Kelly from Colorado, and she was in town recently speaking at NSA North Texas. And I was, I was so intimidated when you came out on stage right before your bio and your introduction was being read, and it was, you were in the um, Navy for 28 years, you were a commander, you've written 13 books? 11. 11 books, and you have several PhDs, and I was just getting so nervous thinking that I would have to sit down and visit with you today. And then you got up on stage, and you started talking, and you kind of were very professional, and you were super friendly, and you were funny, and I thought, okay, I can hang with this, I can, I can do that. So thank you for sitting down with us, Mary. Oh, it's totally my pleasure, and I am not at all intimidated to anybody, in my opinion, but thank you so much. Well, I asked her, for the audience at home, I asked her before we got started, do I call her Commander Kelly, because that is her title. Is that a title right? That's correct. That's her title. Uh, and she goes, no, Wynn, just call me Mary, please. So we're going to do Mary for the interview. So thank you, Mary. Thank you. Now, we are in Dallas today, and then I know you travel continuously. You were um, a Navy CI? I did intelligence and logistics in the Navy. Okay. Yes. And how many, how many years did you do that? So I was fortunate. I did 21 years as a commissioned officer in the Navy. I started out as an ensign, okay. and I made it up to a uh, commander. And you said before that you, taught, you were stationed all over the world, mm -hmm. and your last station was probably the, the hardest. You landed in Hawaii. Well, my, I was in Hawaii for several years. Before that, I was in the Philippines and Japan and Thailand and Australia. And then my very last duty station, I was teaching at the Naval Academy. In Hawaii? No, in, oh, in that oh, was in Oh, in Annapolis. Okay. okay. And how many years have you been a commander? I think I was a commander the last five years. All right. And does being a commander help you out in public? Like, you can't go up to the airline and say, hey, I'm a commander, I need special treatment or anything? Or I don't even know. <laughs> I don't think I've ever you tried that. You've never tried that? that? No. <laughs> played, the, played the commander card? I don't think it works that way. <laughs> no, probably not. It may help you if you're on base somewhere, but off base... When I do drive on base, I get saluted, um, but when, but mostly I have a different ID that allows me access to base, so they never even know what I did. So it's a just a normal old ID that just gets me through, and there's no rank associated with okay. it. Okay, mm -hmm. so they don't know they need to be saluting you. That, they they the don't way. know they should be just you know terribly intimidated. <laughs> like me, I know I need to be terribly <laughs> intimidated right here, <laughs> definitely. So when you're in the Navy, you started uh, speaking was part of your job. Well, it wasn't. It was something that the public affairs person would ask me if I could do. Okay. People would call up and say, hey, can we get the admiral to do something? Well, the admiral is busy. The admiral's out of town. And their second choice was, you know, maybe two or three or ten or forty other people. And then by the time they found somebody who would say yes, they weren't busy, that would be me. So, um, so I may not have been your first choice or your second choice or maybe your fortieth choice. But <laughs> given the opportunity, anything for my friends in the military, if you need something, I'll show up. My day job was very different from speaking. But the military tries to support organizations, uh, Girl Scout Jamboree, Marriott, the FBI, whoever, sure. with conference support. And we love to show up and do talks when possible. So I liked doing it. I was fortunate that this friend of mine kept calling me to do it. So I got a right. lot of practice. Did you ever think that after you got out of the Navy that this would be your vocation going forward? There was one moment, and I will tell you, it was one of those tipping points, as Malcolm Gladwell would say, in my life. Mm -hmm. I had shown up to do this event, and they were very worried because they had no idea how they were going to reimburse my parking, and I wasn't very worried about the parking. Okay. And then they were very worried about um, whether or not there was going to be a seat for me at lunch, and I wasn't worried about that either. But then there was another professional speaker there, and he said, hey, you're pretty good. Have you thought about doing this? And I was like, well, you know, it's kind of a fun thing for a hobby. And he says, oh, no, this this is a profession. I went, what? And he, right. and he said, so... I stayed at this hotel and they paid my expenses and all this. And he was outlining all these benefits. And I went, wait, one of us is doing this poorly. Right. And I'm pretty yes. sure I know who that is. That <laughs> I was just worried about my, they were worried about paying my parking and they're paying him to come in. Right. And I went, and I said, do you really think I could do this? Because sometimes, as you know, we need somebody else's objective opinion to let us know, hey, you're good at that. That's mm -hmm. something you should consider doing. And for me, he was that person. To give us permission to do that. Well, not not necessarily permission, but validation and encouragement that, hey, you know, you, th you thought you were going in this direction. And in reality, this is what's actually happening. Sure. And you, you can actually do this. 
Yeah, and you may be better than that than you think. Right. Yeah. Nice. Now, how long have you been speaking professionally outside the Navy? Since the day I retired out of the Navy okay. in 2008. The, wow. The day I retired, I said, you know what? I think I can make this speaking thing work. Mm -hmm. And I, in my, in my little strategic brain, I said, okay, now if I do everything for three to five years, I'll give it three to five years to see how that works. And then if it works, great. If it doesn't, I'll go do something else. Yeah, you can always move back in with your parents. That's yeah. right. I can always move back in with my parents. <laughs> because we are here today in my mom and dad's house. Yes. And that is my parents' dog barking in the background. In Dallas, Texas. It's a beautiful home. Now, did you grow up in this house? I did. Okay, nice. I did. So when I come back to visit, I still get to sleep in the twin bed I grew up in. It's awesome. <laughs> with a little go-kart, a little foot, uh, uh, windmill. <laughs> On the on it and Barbie Barbie sheets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, lovely, uh -huh. lovely, nice. Mm -hmm. Tell me about when you first started speaking. What were some like one or two or three obstacles you had to overcome right away? First, I had no list. Uh, and a list, what like? Great question. Yes. When I would go to do speaking for the military, obviously I wasn't collecting business cards. I wasn't getting attendee lists. Right. I I didn't even have paperwork. It wasn't like there was a contract. They're like, can you show up? Me, okay, that was it. There was no paper trail. So when I had to go back and validate some speaking opportunities, there wasn't a paperwork, there was nothing. So I started out with no list. Second, because of my profession, we weren't allowed at that time to have social media or even have a URL. Right. So I don't have my name as a URL. I have drmarykelly.com, okay. but I had to think of something else, blessing and a curse. So I came up with productive leaders. Well, who, who wants an unproductive leader? Right. Seems kind of silly. Seems kind of silly. But I didn't have a name. I had zero social media, no list, and I didn't have a base. When I left Maryland, I hadn't even lived in the United States for more than a couple of years as a grown-up. I had no base of operations. I didn't know anybody who was in business. I did, right. I did not even know who hired speakers. Wow. I had no idea. So you had no network outside the military. Because I was, I was in, I was in sure. Southeast Asia most of my career. That was your life. Mm -hmm. It was my life. Well, you could have started speaking in Southeast Asia. I could have done you know? that too. <laughs> I could have done that now, too. Now, do you ever get to go, you know, abroad or overseas to speak? I do. I love travel. I still love travel. After right. all this time, I love to travel. And I've been fortunate enough to go back to Southeast Asia, to Cambodia, um, Vietnam, Laos, and uh, speak in those areas as well at Thailand last year. And then in a few weeks, I'm going to take off again and go to go back to Europe. Um, I've spoken in about a half a dozen countries in Europe, and I get I'm so fortunate to be able to do that. This time, I'm going to head into Bulgaria, Albania, and Macedonia. Wow! Because. Why not? Why not? Sure. sure. Why not? They're paying you to be there. Okay. So I, but I love travel. I'm like, wait, wait. I love it when I have to look up where I have to go. Wait, right. what country, where am I going? That's great. <laughs> well, I love it. Last Saturday, you talked about Nashville a lot. Mm -hmm. You like Nashville, I'm sure, because the country and western scene, the music, the bars on the, I was there last year, the main street there. Mm -hmm. um, I love Nashville. I love... Well, I love every place. So if somebody says you get to go here, I get all excited. Wait, I've never been there. That's a new that's a new adventure. I love it every day. I love new people, new travel, new experiences, new places. Anything new that I can do, I love new. That's neat. So any place. Um, Nashville is one of my favorite cities just because I've been going there for a while. And I do. I love the music. I love the bars. I love the food. I love the atmosphere. I love the sense of fun and the sense right. of humor. So laid back. So, so like that. Mm -hmm. Tell me about, you have, I'm sorry, how many books out? 11. 11 books. Mm -hmm. And you have a wine for each book. And they said that you craft or create your, your own wine for each new book has a new wine. Well, I'm so fortunate because I've got somebody who makes them for me. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when you have a new book out, do you say, tell the wine maker that, oh, this needs to be, the wine needs to taste um, engaging and authoritative and salesy. <laughs> you know, do you, do you kind of do that or is it not really? It's really not that not, complicated. No. It's really not that complicated. So on the Why Leaders Fail and the Seven Prescriptions for Success, it's a little bit heavy but with a nice message. Okay. Um, for the 15 ways to grow your business and every economy, uh, grow Grigio, that worked. Um, military team building, that's a Barbara. Sometimes it's just the letter. All right. Nice. Mm -hmm. And you get to have like a wine tasting, so you go in and, and he says, okay, here's the four that I've made for you. Pick the one you want. Or... Oh, no. No. It's just bottling day is a fun, fun day. Okay. Some in the bottle, some for me. I yeah, mean, it's a yeah. fun day. One bottle, one me. One bottle, one me. It's a fun day. And how do you, 
can we buy this online or do we have to come to Colorado and be invited to the mansion and <laughs> the have mansion. some vino. <laughs> the mansion. <laughs> uh, um, so the humble abode. And uh, yes, it can only be gifted. Okay. I will tell you how I use it though. When you travel for conferences, mm -hmm. I will frequently bring a couple of bottles with me because you can actually pack wine. There are these neat container things that I share with people and they love them so you can travel with it. Anyway, when you go to a conference, if you're a wine drinker, a lot of times if you're at a hotel where there's no bar, Right. This is, this is, these are desperate times. Sure. Then what I did is I put together this book package because I don't like to sell, as you know. I'm a terrible salesperson. Yes. So I put together this package. I'm like, with five, with five books, you get wine. And I'd have a couple bottles of wine sitting there. And people go, can we buy the wine? No, because but, I'm not a licensed wine seller. But you can buy the books. But you can buy the books. But you got to buy five books. But you got to buy five <laughs> books. And, um, <laughs> and, and the books go to charity. I mean, they, the, you make the check out to a charity. Right. And then, so you're not really buying anything. You're making a donation to a charity. And then I'm saying thank you by giving you these five books and a bottle of wine and a wine bottle opener. Because, you know, some, wow. people, some people are amateurs. They don't carry it with them. Yeah, we exactly. Yes, I've got one in every camera bag. You've got to be prepared. You've got to be prepared. Uh, you know, be a Girl Scout. Be prepared. That's right. Be a Navy, uh, Navy intelligence officer. Mm -hmm. Be prepared. But it's a fun That's marketing so cool. thing. That's cool. Yeah. Well, many times in business, I think we make things too hard. Mm -hmm. We say, oh gosh, everybody else is doing this. We've got to hire this organization or this advertising firm or this marketing machine. Wait a second. What is uniquely you that people, set are grav that people gravitate towards, that people like? And what is it about you that people say, wow, when I think of Win, I think of this. That's, that's what branding really is to me. And so when we think about that, when people know me, they go, Mary. Mary loves wine and dogs and her fun and her friends, and she'll do anything for a charity. And that's exactly what I want them to know. That's kind of, that's kind of what I want them to, to remember, even in front of audiences who just met me. Okay. So, a couple times, you'll notice I worked it in, mm -hmm. the wine and the dogs. Yes, stories about both. Stories about both, you because bet. it makes it fun and it makes it relatable. Yeah. And that's, I think, what a lot of audiences need most from us, is they need to know that, gosh, my life is having this issue right now, but wait a second, she had that issue, and she's just like me, and that's what I want them to get. So, Mary, do you think we were talking about being engaging and being really a personality on camera, do you think the more your audiences know about you, before time, the better interaction you have with them while you're, while you're there on stage? I don't honestly know. I think there's part of it where people look at the program description mm -hmm. and what they're looking at is, how is this going to help me? Because I'm not just competing with maybe another session. I'm not competing with another speaker. Right. I am competing with every single other thing they could be doing at that moment. And the opportunity cost, this is The Economist talking, the opportunity <laughs> cost, the highest best use of their time. We all triage our time all the time, constantly, whether we think about it or not. So when somebody's reading that description, they have to go, well, okay, she can deliver this to me. Is it real? Can this help me? Is this a better option than anything else I could be doing? And that's what we have to convey, I think, in our descriptions and what we tell them ahead of time. Okay. And then once we get there, we need to deliver because otherwise, now we're competing with that little gadget that's right there that is not one yep. second away. And and we've seen, we've all seen it where all of a sudden somebody will get up to talk and people reach for the phone and you've lost them forever. Yeah, they never look up. And they never look up because they have decided that the value on their phone is greater than the value on the platform. And we as speakers, that's that's our competition, is that phone. Right. Mm -hmm. And you can't say, ladies and gentlemen, we're taping today, so please turn off your phone. Doesn't happen anymore. But think about that. When you are at a concert, you know, the Eagles don't say, hey, everybody, please turn off your phones. No. And no. I want them to be taping. I want them to be talking. Yeah. I want them to be Selfie taking with pictures. the band. I want them to do all that. What I don't want is them playing solitaire because right. I'm not adding enough value. That that would just, that would be a knife right in the heart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, um, I think that with, in today's economy or in today's technology world, there's some speakers that enhance the laptop and the iPhone and the iPad and they, they kind of make it interactive with their talk but there's so many of us that don't that if we could just figure out somehow to incorporate that so you do have permission to open it up but then you want them to see what you want what what you want them to see on the screen well and keep in mind how many people are distracted so quickly right how much focus are you really asking people when you say please open up your computer pull out your tablet grab your phone squirrel right and then all of a sudden they see well a text from their daughter or something like that now you've lost them 
and you're the one who led them down that path. So I think this is, re we have to be so good without technology that if there's technology, it enhances, it doesn't overtake. And this is where I think a lot of speakers are struggling. So I've, I will frequently, I will never say, pull, put, put away your phone. Right. No, I have a slide that says, if you're on your phone, I assume you're tweeting about me, ha ha ha, which is kind of true. Sure. I would hope that they would, and I'm kind of giving them the gentle suggestion. But here's the thing. I can't tell somebody, no, turn off your phone. You've got a brand new baby at home with a new babysitter. Are no. You, who am I to say that to somebody? Everybody gets to make their own decisions. And hopefully, for that hour or two hours a day, I am the best time they have and the best way possible that they're going to spend their time. Hopefully, I'm that. But but I can't I can't mandate that. I have to I have to coerce them into that like the Eagles, like you Shania bet. Twain, like a great rock band, like whoever. You bet. Mm -hmm. Well, I think if you bring your A game, if you give them value on and off the stage, then you're going to be invited back. You're going to get referrals. You're going to be talked about. And if they are tweeting, then yeah, hopefully it's about you. But hopefully. otherwise, you know, hopefully they will also get enough things that works for them. Right. So I also know many people who can listen and be taking notes or listen and answer an email. And I'm fine with, I'm really comfortable with that. People, people need to do whatever is best for them. Yeah. When you were on stage, I was in the back of the room sitting next to uh, Bruce Arston and um, Glenna Heck and Glenna was typing. And you know, I was trying to take notes and a lot of times I was like, oh, what did she say? And you know, and, and Glenna was, she had it down pretty much word for word. And I was like, oh, I can, oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't have to really take that many notes. I was just still Glenna's. That's um, awesome. But yeah, I mean, you were talking, I don't know, two or three hundred words a minute, you were like a little just boom. And all the information was just incredible. So I, I, I walked away with too many takeaways. I, I don't know where to get started, which is awesome. a nice problem to have. Well, thank you. I yeah. appreciate that. I do tend to talk quickly. And part of that is intentional. Part of that is because the average human can listen five times faster than the average human talks. And if you've Not ever, when you're on stage. Not when I'm on stage. <laughs> But if you've ever gone into, like, think of your teacher from high school, mm -hmm. wah, 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 and it's people's like, eyes oh. glaze over, and everybody, the energy falls, and everybody takes forever. Boom! I try not to do that. I, my audiences are smart. I mostly deal with people who are very linear, people who understand profit improvement, and my audiences are smart. So if I went in and spoke slowly or was very crafty with monotone. my words, monotone, they would be checked out in the first eight seconds and I would never get them back. You bet. And you don't. Oh, you thanks. don't do any of that. You're so kind. Thank you. Well, how did you pick on your topic? Did you start out talking about what you are today or did it evolve over, over the years? So here's the big secret on that. Mm -hmm. When I would be called to go do talks for the Navy, at home were my dogs. Well... I missed my dogs all day because I had my normal work day during the day and then I would go off and do these talks for the Navy at night. So then I thought, well, if I incorporate my dog into the talk, then I could bring my dog to the talk. Okay. So that was where I came up with the Master Your World, 10 dog-inspired leadership lessons to improve productivity, profit, and communication. And I would bring my, at the time I had two very, very well-trained dogs, very well-trained dogs. And I would bring them to my events and they would be, and I would work them into the act. So they'd be on stage with you. They'd be on stage with me, off leash, <laughs> performing. So I got oh, David Letterman yeah. show here. Totally. So it's like an extra 10 points when you bring a dog. Oh, easily. Yeah. 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 And, and then and, and you walk into the hotel and someone's like, oh, you can't have dogs. There. Oh, that's Mary Kelly. She's a keynote. Oh, well, right. Okay. I'm like, oh, it's not a yeah. dog. It's a prop. And they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah it's, okay. A, it's a live prop. Right. <laughs> Because also, it also makes me, again, more approachable that you spoke to in the beginning. Mm -hmm. But if you look at, oh, a military person, how is their life going to possibly relate to my life? How can a military person relate to my business? There's a right. big delta there. And I think the dogs help me bridge that delta. Nice. And so, are you, are you still talking? I mean, do you, don't, do you still bring your dogs to... To your workshops and your keynotes and... I would love to, but right now I have some of the world's dumbest animals. <sighs> I know, I love them so much, but not smart. Okay. Not smart. So you can't do it? No. Yeah. So are they at doggy daycare? Or at the ranch? They're, that... they're back in Colorado. Oh, they have okay. a full-time dog sitter. Nice. Mm -hmm. Great. We used to take our dogs to a place down at Holland Park, and then they'd get on a bus and take them outside the city to camp. And, you know, camp had like, I don't know, five or six acres and a couple of ponds. And that's where they would go play during the holidays and when we were out of town. Uh, mine are just at the house. Yeah. yeah. Mine are just at the house. <laughs> well, Mary, do you have any other new books coming out? 
Thank you for asking, and the answer is yes. I have a book on transitioning workplaces, succession planning, and then bringing in the new generation of the Gen Zers. Um, so it's succession planning, but also transitional planning. And I'm coming out with that with another speaker named Marieth Elliott Powell. Okay. She's brilliant. She's out of North Carolina. My last book, of course, Why Leaders Fail, was with Peter Stark. And we're working on another book on the future of leadership and what the work environment looks like. And then I have two others that are sitting in the works. Um, one is on high-performance team building that is going to be published by Wiley. And then the other one is just a leadership book, again, for more elevated things. And so I've got about four books working right now. And airplanes, I'm telling you, that's where you write. Really? Because there's no distractions. There's nothing you can do. Right. The Internet usually doesn't work anyway. Why would you waste your time watching a movie you don't care about when you can have two hours of uninterrupted writing time? It's great. So I can tell you've been slacking this year. You really, you're not, you don't have your priorities set. I can tell. Mary. Totally right, because I don't have that other book done yet. You're absolutely right. <laughs> You're close, though, right? Yeah. Close to that. And well, can we find everything on Amazon? Um, you, the your, good ones. Your good ones, okay. <laughs> the good ones. The good, okay. So most of the things, most of the titles are on Amazon. I have a personal finance um, bestseller that worked out pretty well for me called Money Smart. Uh, the, the, the snarky tagline on that is how not to buy cat food when you don't have a cat. <laughs> because, okay. well, I was in the Navy, and I was an exec... Mm -hmm. We call it executive school where you're getting ready to take command, but you have to do like the training wheels job first. And as I was sitting there, one of my other friends there said, uh, so are you in the stock market? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, yeah. And she said, I'm afraid of the stock market. And I said, I'm afraid of being old and not having cat food and, ha and, and having to buy cat food when right. I don't have a cat at home because physiologically we can survive on cat food. I don't want right. to be that person. Yeah. So so she laughed, and that kind of became this impetus for, I would ask people, so are you saving for retirement? And they would say, no. And I'm like, well, so do you, do you really like love cat, cat food? food? <laughs> I mean, how much do you love the cat food? <laughs> and, and that just kind of drew, drove it home for them. Like, well, oh, no. I'm like, well, do you know that 36% of Americans are not saving anything for retirement? 78% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck, mostly because they're just spending. It's not because wow. they don't make enough money. That right now, 33% of Americans say that they think they're going to be living solely on Social Security when they get older, and they have to. Good luck with that. Right. 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 So all of these statistics are horrifying. Right now, the average American cannot come up with $400 to meet an unexpected expense, such as new tires, wow. new washing machine, or a small crisis. So these things really scare me, and financial literacy is high on my list. The Money Smart book, by the way, mm -hmm. online on the website. Um, I also have a Spanish version. Okay. I had a very good friend of mine who translated it into Spanish so that the Hispanic community can access that. It's 100% free all the time forever. And that was one of the reasons why we did that, was to make the, the information accessible. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. That's giving back. Well, definitely. we're so lucky to be yes. able to do what we do. We this are. Is, this is such a great profession. And I will tell you that my friends in NSA are fabulous. The National Speakers Association has taken what could, what could be some potential that could have gone not so great and, and really blown it up. helped me make it a business. And it's through the conferences, through the friendships, through the networking, through the support, referrals, just learning from each other. It's fabulous. It's just fabulous. And of course, I started in this chapter. This was where I first... Did you really? I, I didn't know that. I first, North, North I first joined NSA in September, and then this was where my home of record, you know, from being in the military. So okay. I came back here, went to a couple meetings, and then I migrated west. To Colorado. Mm -hmm. But I still consider this to be my first chapter. Nice. It's like your first boyfriend or girlfriend. <laughs> That's so nice. Well, I want to thank you for sitting down with us today. Um, your knowledge and your insights is just invaluable. And thank you for being friendly with me and kind and gentle with me. Oh, my goodness. Of thank course. You. Of course. If you like the interview today and you want to see more of these, just go to North NSA North Texas YouTube channel or my Focus to Win YouTube channel. Or this will probably be linked to Mary's channel. Mary, what's your website? How can we find you? I am at ProductiveLeaders.com. It's ProductiveLeaders.com. And, of course, if you want me, it's Mary, standard spelling, not like Christmas, Mary at ProductiveLeaders.com. And if you shoot me an email and you've got a question on anything, um, audience out there, just let me know and I will respond. And if you have an exotic location to, for Mary to speak at, she will be there even faster. I'm, I'm sure. You're there. I'm You're there. there. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you so much. I appreciate it.